Huge thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. More from them in a bit. Underwater Living. The new craze sweeping the nation in the future year of 2010. Board your aqua car. Get fitted with your aqua lungs. Look, a fish, a crab, a lobster. Your new self-sustaining habitat uses micro sea algae to generate electricity or something. This is truly paradise, or it would be if it wasn't a terrible idea. For a long time, people have been predicting that in the future, we, the humans, will live underwater. And I'm not talking like sunken cities or Atlantis. I don't mean like floating megastructures or artificial islands. I mean underwater. Cities under the water, underwater houses, underwater hotels, underwater underwater red lobsters. This all might sound very weird because it is weird, but to get to that point, you're gonna have to humor me for a bit because this needs a lot of context. And before we get into all of that, War Thunder is the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. You can use more than 2,000 different tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships in dynamic combined arms PvP battles. Spanning over a century of extensively historically accurate vehicles with extreme attention to detail. We're not talking just HP points here. You got detailed vehicle damage models, which means these machines suffer actual damage like they're in combat. You want some style? Then you got some in-depth customization system for, for your vehicles. Look at that. Go download and play War Thunder on PC, Xbox, or PlayStation using my link in the description. If you haven't played in the past six months, or ever before, you can get yourself a large bonus pack, including multiple premium vehicles, an exclusive 3D decorator, and a premium account. Man's relationship with the sea is complicated. The waterways gave us civilization, transportation, but for the most part, the oceans were just a big scary, spooky, dark place. A lot of people used to venture out into the unknown. And where'd they go? I don't know. They died. They probably died. I don't want to give the impression that everybody was just unnaturally scared of sea monsters or perpetual whirlpools or holes to the center of the earth, but people were. If you were alive during, I don't know, this time to this time, anywhere in between there, the ocean was a mystery. And the best advice was just stay away. Like, yeah, there's probably something over here, probably something over there, and it, it probably wants to kill you. This was an alien world. You don't have submarines, diving equipment, equipment is fairly primitive, and there's really not a reason to find out what's down in the murky depths of the Pacific. From the perspective of the of the landlubbers, all they saw was that a lot of people went out into the sea and they never came back. So they just kind of formed their own conclusions. Natural curiosity is a powerful thing though. And even by the 1600s, people were trying to make sense of what the oceans were. These researchers, these naturalists, these scientists weren't often willing to get on the ships though. That was, it was still, still too scary. Don't want to get the scurvy. Now, even if you did manage to get on a ship, it was unlikely that the captain and crew would value or respect the work of the researcher because they were just kind of slowing them down. Like all this science, stuff who cares about it we got to go fight the spanish nobody's gonna stop the ship so you can measure the ph levels of a whale or whatever people were doing back then obviously some details of the ocean were valuable information like the the captain and crew were well informed on winds and currents and all that stuff but yeah for the most part it was just scary ocean scary ocean bad don't worry about it don't worry about it by the early 1800s though, things were starting to change. Steamboats were cutting down the amount of time it took to cross the Atlantic significantly, making the voyage less of, well, a voyage and more a casual affair. Unless they exploded, and that happened a lot. But this was a big shift in how people perceived these waters. Before this, if you wanted to get from Europe to America, it'd take you like a month and a half. Now, less than two weeks. Odds of survival, probably 80% or so. That's pretty good. And people just start getting more interested in the stuff because, well, the economy, the, look, the railroads are getting built. That allows the fish to be imported inwards. That means there's more demand for the fish, more demands to figure out where the fish are coming from. Steamboats increase global trade. Let's find some trade routes. I guess they were doing that well before that, but second industrial revolution starts popping up. The seas are pretty important for combat and people can move around them pretty quickly. The average person was also seeing more leisure time. People started visiting the beaches. The wealthy were getting their own yachts. And by the mid 1800s, humanity's long held fears of the ocean began to morph into fascination. There was a lot of wacky theories about what was going on down in the deep 
People speculated that since the depths of the ocean were so dark that the sun couldn't reach down there, photosynthesis couldn't take place, plants couldn't grow, and life probably didn't exist beneath like 1800 feet. A lot of people believe that the bottom of the ocean was just a void of nothing. But this changed. 1859, first transatlantic telegraph cables laid across the Atlantic. That's pretty impressive until it broke. And when they pulled it out, they discovered a bunch of sea critters. And this disproved that whole theory that the bottom of the ocean was empty, spurring even more interest. Because how do the creatures live down there? What weird stuff is going on to support life? You might be asking yourself right now, what does this have to do with living under the sea? Well, you see, all of these developments, all this stuff that was going on, fueled the writings of people like Jules Verne, who published 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea in 1869. Now, this story is about the ocean. I got I gotta sum this up quick. Basically, there's a mystery going on. Ships are getting destroyed. People think there's a big narwhal doing it. And everybody's trying to figure out where's the narwhal. Three dudes on a ship are looking for this narwhal, but they fall into the ocean and they don't find a narwhal. They find a big submarine commanded by the mysterious Captain Nemo. This weird vehicle is called the Nautilus, and it's a uh, like I said, it's a submarine, a fancy submarine. It can travel all across the world without stopping to refuel, powered by salt water itself. It can descend to the ocean floor and all the mechanics are managed by newfangled technologies like electricity. All accommodations from water to alcohol to food seem to be created by ocean plants and ocean things. The ship has many amazing treasures and a library and it's a fun place to be, a fun place for a fun underwater adventure. But a lot of people read this and they thought, I want to live under the ocean. I want to be with Captain Nemo and go kill sea otters or whatever, whatever they were doing. This story sparked a lot of people's imagination. Now, Verne did not invent the idea of the sub, but what he did envision was drastically different than the submarines that existed at the time. Late 1860s, for the most part, you were finding subs that could go maybe 10, 15, 30 feet max beneath the water, which is not that deep. Divers using the best equipment might manage to get down to the 130 foot mark, but for the most part, these oceans were just as mysterious as any alien world, and Vern took advantage of that. Right around this time, we also have the start of the HMS Challenger expedition in 1871. This was by far the most ambitious venture to study the oceans and today is often cited as the first major scientific expedition of the seas. Countless new species discovered, cool stuff, and all of this started to really spark the interest of the average person. I think the best comparison here might be something like the space age, you know? How in the 60s and 70s, a lot of people were drawn in and interested by space. Imagine that the late 1800s were the ocean age. Like, you know, people were buying aquariums. That was a that was a trend. They would go to fish conventions. French picture series. N La N 2000. This thing has a lot of a lot of different images. A lot of great images predicting what the world might look like in the year 2000. Now this thing in and of itself probably deserves its own video, so I don't want to spoil too much. But let's just focus on the underwater parts. One of the more famous drawings depicts a whale bus, which is a bus driven by a whale. You might ask, why? And yeah, that is a, that's a fair question. Croquet underwater people riding seahorses i don't think seahorses are this big reverse fishing <laughs> a group of people attending an underwater race going out for a picnic and getting attacked by a giant squid and probably my favorite of the bunch the underwater cafe look at that who wouldn't want to eat there how would you eat there how would that how would that work all of these images have similarities uh that being that they're underwater but people are doing whatever they would do above water beneath it you know they drive submarines like cars sure you gotta wear these fancy suits to do anything to survive but that's a small price to pay for whale bus early 20th century humans were getting something of an ego boost we have conquered the earth now we've moved on to the skies. People can fly now. And this got people thinking, what if we 
could change the world. This idea of terraforming the earth for man's desires was not uncommon around this time. In the early 1900s, engineer Carol Carl, Carol Riker, in the early 1900s, Riker proposed a plan to shift the Gulf Stream by building what would be a nearly 200 mile long dock out from Newfoundland. His plan was the, the Gulf Stream would just shift up shift in this direction the benefit of this would be nicer weather during the winter in america and northern europe it would also melt all the pesky icebergs that were hindering the transportation of goods and people across the north atlantic he also believed it would shift the earth on its axis and give these areas of the world perpetual daylight. Surprisingly, this proposal was considered a lot longer than you would think. And for several decades, Riker tried to get this whole thing approved and even got more ambitious with the idea. He suggested the creation of a new country located on an island in the North Atlantic to oversee all of the future global ocean, new ocean order sort of, you know, plans. Wacky plans from a wacky dude. Prominent British politician Frederick the Fredster Smith fancied himself a futurist and brought with him some pretty big ideas. One idea was to, I don't really understand this. Uh, so Einstein was doing his thing, E equals MC squared, which in the M is mass. Water has mass. So what if you took the water, you turn it into energy, the onboard here, and then you take Ireland and move it into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. That was his plan. He feared the use of tidal power, you know, harnessing the waves and the gravitational energy uh, of those waves to generate electricity. He feared this could slow down the Earth's rotation and make days last 48 hours long. I don't know where he got those numbers. Uh, if he used calculations or math to reach these conclusions, but I appreciate the creativity. Uh, the Fredster also had his own set of plans for Africa. The Sahara, kind of boring. A lot of desert, a lot of sand. So what if we just took that and we turned it into a new playground for all Europe? That, that was his words. Based the Fredster. The Fredster was, was pretty based, as the kids would say. His plan was to create a canal through the Mediterranean and create a new sea, I I inland sea in the Sahara Desert, that in his mind would transform the climate into uh, something like Florida. His plan was to turn the Sahara Desert into Florida. Man, <laughs> the Fredster over here. Beyond that, though, yeah, the, the ocean was kind of getting boring. The Earth was getting boring. Not a ton of new places to discover. Maybe we could go to Antarctica, a few more islands to be found in this part of the world. But for the most part, ocean fever, the age of discovery, it's over. In nearly a century after Verne's story was published, the first nuclear powered sub, fittingly named the, the USS Nautilus, became the first vehicle to mostly match Verne's original vision. The real Nautilus had a range of about 2,700 leagues and in the book we can assume that the nautilus goes at least 20,000 leagues 20,000 leagues is pretty far though that's like a third from here to the moon in terms of depth the real nautilus could not hold a candle to Verne's fictional ship this real thing could only go about 700 feet into the ocean 700 feet down while Verne's could descend 10 miles which is impressive even for today even today, we do not have a submarine that can go 10 miles deep because the ocean isn't 10 miles deep. Yeah, again, back in the 1860s, nobody actually really knew how deep the ocean was. So this is kind of just a guess. With the advent of nuclear power, the idea of a self-sustaining environment under the sea finally became a possibility. We could live with Captain Nemo, but people took this idea a little bit too far. So within just a few hundred years, humanity's relationship with the oceans had completely shifted. People had gone from fearful of the underwater unknown murky depths, scary squids. But over time, that fear turned to curiosity. New discoveries had been made. The early 1900s, people were entering the skies. Surely, inevitably, we would conquer the seas. So yeah, during the second half of the 20th century, we will start to see some real progress get made on some of these underwater dreams but i'm gonna save that for next time i'm not doing that today 
Again, huge thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. And if you haven't played in the past six months, you can get that large pack of fancy things, including multiple premium vehicles and an exclusive 3D decorator and that premium account.